Let's open our Bibles to uh, chapter 24, as you see on the screen, remembering why Jesus came on the first Resurrection Sunday. And basically the message is this. When Jesus stepped from the tomb, he said, remember why I died. I died so that no one has to die in their sins. I died on the cross to pay the atoning sacrifice. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, and he said, tell everyone that through repentance, their sins can be remitted. And so what we're doing in Luke 24, in the first eight verses, is joining those disciples on that very first Resurrection Sunday morning and thinking through the process of how God the Father sent an angel, and finally Jesus himself showed up to remind them of what they're supposed to remember and what they're supposed to so vividly have on their hearts that we just can't stop telling people why Jesus died and what he's done for me. But chapter 24, the first eight verses, these faithful women are actually there on the scene. Unlike us, we're 20 centuries removed. They are at ground zero of the greatest event in history. We've been in the greatest week and then the greatest weekend, but now this is the greatest moment when the work is finished and the sacrifice, Jesus Christ himself, has stepped out of the tomb, conquering death and sin and our pains of hell. Think about what it must have been like for those women to have experienced what we read about here. Truly it was ground zero on Resurrection Sunday morning the scriptures tell us that there were at least five women and they gathered to begin their mission that first Sunday morning following Christ's crucifixion and his burial. They have started walking through Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of Christ's ministry, the Palm Sunday Jerusalem, the place where he was crucified and buried, and they start walking before dawn and it was quiet and strangely silent as they were carrying those oils and spices. Now, you remember they were coming to properly bury. It's kind of like when men do things, you know, they don't quite do it right. And so the women were coming to do it right. You know, they were going to anoint and wash and they were going to do what they didn't feel Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had properly done in their haste. Remember, the first witnesses of the resurrection were those women who didn't even believe there was going to be one. And what, a, what an amazing moment it was and so, they're walking through those dark and quiet streets. They go out the city gate. As they're walking, God has sent an angel to open the tomb for them. They're talking about, you know, how they're going to get the stone open anyway. And the earthquake and blinding brightness of that angel knock the soldiers out, paralyze them with fear, and finally they just scatter from the scene. And so those women walk into the garden, and they're in the place around that tomb where soon Jesus will be seen. And if you remember, he'll be mistaken for being a gardener by Mary Magdalene. And then, as they walk closer, they're so close to where the crucifixion site was, where Christ died earlier that week. But as they enter by the faint light of early morning, they find the garden and they're shocked at the already open tomb, and, and they can see, the Bible says, that exceedingly large stone that was rolled away from the door. And so, in the darkness, they go into that dark stone-cut chamber. And as their eyes adjust, they see inside that now empty tomb for the very first time. And as they stand there, they were the first witnesses of the resurrection. Those five-plus women have seen that Christ was risen as he promised. And as yet, they didn't even know that the greatest event of all time had been completed. Here before them, in Luke 24, we have the inspired record that these women are on that very spot. They're there on that very day of Christ's resurrection morning, and there they get the first message from God. The first time God reveals anything after the resurrection, those women are the recipients. And that's what's in the first eight verses. God saying, this is what I want you to remember about the resurrection. So, Luke 24, the first eight verses. Let's stand together. As you stand, we're going to read these verses. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word this morning, uh, 
there is a, a copy, a Bible in every pew here in one of those tra- racks in front of you. There's a copy of the scriptures. And if you don't have your own Bible and you'd really like one, you can take one. It's our Resurrection Sunday gift to you, and I hope that you will use that. But let's read and you follow along in Luke 24. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Let's bow together. Lord, I pray we would remember his words this morning, that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he said. He came because you so loved the world that you sent him, that anyone who believes in his sacrifice, in him, the sacrifice, would not have to perish in everlasting punishment for their sins, but have everlasting life. I pray that we would remember and that we would listen as those women listened and it slowly dawned on them that that everything you promised had taken place and that your greatest promise that we could have endless, guilt-free, hope-filled life forever with you, paradise as you would call it, was real and was theirs, as it's ours today. I pray that no one would come to Resurrection Sunday, to a service where your word is preached, and leave without knowing their sins have been forgiven, their guilt has been placed on Christ, and that they have reservations with all the redeemed in heaven, the paradise of God. Work in our midst, draw to yourself, some, and especially today, that they might call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. What a day to come to know you on your resurrection day. Bless us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. God said through the angels, remember Christ's words. Remember what he said. Remembering What God told us to remember is what Resurrection Sunday is all about. Remembering that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world and that whoever calls out to him never will perish but will always have endless life. Today we gather as those who love Jesus Christ and with those who for 2,000 years have celebrated a crucified, buried, and risen Lord and Savior. There's so many ways we could do that. We could go back through these eight events up through Mary finding Jesus is not the gardener, but actually the Lord of glory. We could go through all of Christ's 10 post-resurrection appearances. We could trace the impact each of these events had on those who saw him, who fell at his feet, who felt his touch. There are many, many more ways that we could look at this. But this morning, just to do what he said, If you notice what it says in verse 7, it says, remember, verse 6, remember, verse 8, remember his words. That's what the Lord wants us to do and we shall do this morning. Keep going down in Luke 24 to verse 46. I want to show you um, a little bit further down the page how Jesus himself reinforces this concept that resurrection morning is a morning to remember what God accomplished and what he wants us to realize in our lives. And Jesus said it in verse 46. Then he said to them, he, he gathered together and, and met the 
with the apostles, and he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47, chapter 24. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. What are we supposed to remember? That Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus rose, so that we could go everywhere and say that remission of sin is possible for all who repent of their sin, their own way. They're trying to save themselves. Anything other than simply casting ourselves on Christ, we're to repent of. And if we turn in repentant faith to him. Jesus said, look at verse 47, remission of sins is proclaimed in his name. Jesus came, he told us, to seek and to save the lost. Jesus died as the savior of the world. That is the simple lesson for us. Jesus came to save us from our sins. Do you remember that's how Christmas begins this whole process? At the Christmas story time in Matthew chapter 1, the angel comes to Joseph and says, when this little boy is born, when you get to name him on the eighth day, this is what you name him. Call his name Jesus, but it doesn't end there. The one who will save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus came as a savior. Jesus came to reveal God the Savior to the world. And he came to be the sacrificial lamb to accomplish our salvation. If we look closely at Christ's words, we find he was always seeking to save the lost. He was always speaking to people of their desperate need that only he could fill and meet in need. And wherever Jesus went through his ministry, he was always seeking and saving lost men and lost women, whether they were poor or rich or dreadfully handicapped or perfectly healthy. All were lost. All of them needed him. And he let them know that. They needed the gospel. In fact, to Christ's final hours, that's exactly what he's doing. Usually you find out what's really important to someone. They never stop doing it, even at the end. And even to the end, the last moments of Christ's earthly life, he is proclaiming the gospel to the people at the feet of the cross and involved in a soul-winning operation with one of the two thieves hanging next to him. When Jesus spoke those seven short, pain-filled gasps, even with all that pain, Jesus is still seeking to save the lost. Now, you know, there's a dimension of the sacrifice of Christ that always fascinates me. You know, for 1,500 years, the Israelites had been following the prescribed method of a lamb upon an altar that was sacrificed for this picture that God had instituted. But for 1,500 years, the lambs had just silently been slain and cut up and their blood poured out and they were burned on the altar. But on this altar... On this day, it's the first time while the sacrifice was bleeding to death, the lamb spoke. And he spoke of seeking and saving. You see, all the sacrifices pointed to Christ as the only hope, the way of salvation, but they all silently had done that for 1,500 years until the lamb of God came. And as his blood poured his intercession and seeking to save the lost flowed from him. It's the most amazing thing to think of Jesus who came to save us from our sins and he himself from the cross spoke of love, of forgiveness, and of salvation. As soon as the blood being offered by Christ on the altar of that cross began to pour out, he began to intercede for those who murdered him as the great high priest that he was. While they cruelly abused him, he forgives. While they mock him, out comes love instead of anger, forgiveness instead of wrath, intercession in the place of condemnation. As the lamb bled on the altar, we hear the kindness and the goodness of God flowing out of the lips of Jesus. Jesus came to forgive our sins. He made that so clear from the cross. As with each other event in his life, Jesus was staying in sync with God's word. 
He knew what God's word had prophesied he'd be doing on the cross. That's in Isaiah 53 in the 12th verse. And, and Jesus was always sinking his life, staying in step like the score of music, like what you just heard this morning. All of those musicians were following the same score. And Jesus followed the word as his operating instructions, his plans for life. And, and it says in Isaiah 53, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, he shall be pouring out his soul unto death, he will be numbered with the transgressors, he will bear the sin of many, and he will intercede for the transgressors. Jesus was interceding for the transgressors. The meaning of Christ's cross is distilled in these words of Isaiah. Jesus did not come to condemn humanity. He came to make a way of salvation for us. The reason he did not blast judgment from the cross is because he came the first time to offer salvation to all who would hear his voice. Jesus came from God to offer mercy. Jesus came to perform redemption, to give forgiveness, to offer endless hope. And he does so in the face of the greatest crime ever perpetrated by mankind to show his mercy and his compassion and that he came to seek and save sinners. You see, God told the angels to tell the women, don't you remember why he came? Don't you remember what he said? Jesus came and told the assembled disciples, don't you remember what I told you? The reason I came to be crucified was so that you could go and tell people, if they will repent of the way they were born and be born again, I'll remit their sins. They will have forgiveness. Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. In fact, if you look back a chapter, in chapter 23 of Luke, you're in 24, look back at 23 and verse 32, because Jesus demonstrates it for us. Remember, I said, whatever's important, we do to the end. What was Jesus doing to the end? Jesus was seeking out sinners within the, the closeness that he could reach out to, being nailed down as far as his voice could reach. He was seeking to share the gospel with them. And he demonstrates it for us. In fact, the first two times Jesus spoke from the cross are right here in this 23rd chapter. Remember, Jesus spoke seven times. The first two are right here, right in the same context as the angel saying, don't you remember? And Jesus said, don't you remember what I said? Well, what did he say? Look at verse 32. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And while he was saying that, it says they were dividing his garments and casting lots. When Jesus speaks to those surrounding him on the cross, we are actually hearing him praying something. In fact, he didn't pray it just once. He prayed it over and over. It's the imperfect indicative verb form. That means those within earshot, those in the close circle of the cross, heard Jesus pray over and over these words of compassion. I think he probably started this as they started nailing him. And instead of spitting and, and cursing them like the other two probably were, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. Father, Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And probably they didn't notice it because everybody talked and did something while they were being nailed. But he keeps saying it. And they heard Jesus pray these words of compassion, which probably started as they spiked him and as they roughly propped him upright. And the first words of Christ from the cross, spoken either as they nailed him or as they lifted him, were right in the midst of the routine of those soldiers as they went through their dragging and holding down and stretching out and pounding spikes through their victims and then raising them. But Jesus repeated over and over those words. He reminded us, he came to die to save sinners. 
Jesus, in his first words from the cross, solidifies why he came, why he died, what we're to remember, what we're to do. These words first spoken capture the heart of God, the Savior. Displayed on the horrific canvas of his son's sacrifice, in what is accepted by all as Christ's first words from the cross, we can hear Christ's heart of compassion. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. To both the soldiers who would hear and the criminals on either side, it was the cry of a Savior's heart to those who were there. So they could know even there and even then, he offered to them full and complete forgiveness. To those criminals surrounding him and the soldiers, they were just everyday sinners. They were just living their lives. They had just been swept into the greatest crime ever committed. And Jesus said, Father, don't hold the crime of mocking me, the thieves, and the the crime of crucifying me, the soldiers, against them. It's interesting. This prayer was answered before our eyes. You know, it's, people love answered prayer. But you know what's neat? To see Jesus' prayer answered in front of us. Because he prayed, Father, forgive them, and he offered forgiveness to them. And one of the two thieves, and at least one and probably more, if you look at all the accounts, the soldiers in one account are plural. There's more than one confessing Christ. So before our very eyes, one of the thieves, and at least one, if not more, of the soldiers are an answer to prayer, to Christ's offer of forgiveness. That means they experienced Christ's forgiveness. And this Resurrection Sunday, the greatest question you could ever be asked is this. Have you experienced what they experienced? Have you heard Jesus offer? Have you responded to him? Have you received complete forgiveness? Not joined, not had something done to you, not said something. Has God done something? Have you, had, have you received complete forgiveness? Forgiveness is the miracle that not only have I personally experienced, it's the miracle that everyone in this room that's saved has experienced. It's the greatest miracle of all that Christ did. The miracle of complete forgiveness because it never goes away. It never ends. Always remember what was on the lips of Jesus at the end of his earthly life. The essence of Christ's love is seen in this dying gasp offering forgiveness. Always remember God freely offered his love through Christ to sinners. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever, even dying on crosses for thievery and rebellion or or participating in the greatest crime that could ever be done, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have endless life. Jesus offered then, Jesus offers now forgiveness. Christ's prayer from the cross makes his forgiveness available to every sinful human. But not all will avail themselves of it. But it's a statement that even those involved in the greatest crime that could ever be offered to God, the greatest sin that could be committed, crucifying God, even they could be forgiven. And Jesus said, that means it's open to all. Forgiveness must be accepted as well as given, but complete forgiveness is available. You know what we're supposed to remember? We're supposed to remember with everyone we see, either they are forgiven or they're not. Either they have endless life or they have endless death. Either they have the Son or they don't. God says everybody in this world are in two camps. It's not ethnicity, it's spiritual orientation. Are you oriented toward helpless, hopeless, coming to the feet of the cross and crying out to Christ and allowing him to save you or not? That's the two groups in the world. Complete forgiveness is available in this Resurrection Sunday morning. Have you believed, accepted, and experienced the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers to us sinful humans? If so, you've been born again. And with God, once we're born again, we have no past. 
We're like a baby. We only have a future. And that's what the new birth does for us. What happens to someone who truly believes that they're forgiven? Well, Christ's forgiveness is like having a deadly patch of skin cancer or some other horrific cancer removed by a skilled doctor. And that cancer troubles us until it's surgically cut away and it's forever gone. Salvation is like forgiveness that means my deadly cancer of sin is taken care of permanently. Christ's forgiveness is like having some huge bill that is paid by another. We know in our heart that we're going to lose our home or our lights or our whatever, and it's going to be cut off, and we're counting down the days, and then someone pays the bill, and we're spared the cutoff, the termination. Forgiveness is when my bills are forever paid. They'll never come due. I'll never face a termination notice that I have to pay for them forever. Christ's forgiveness is like having some murderous stalker that stands in the distance, threatening us with evil and dangerous intent, and we can't sleep or rest. We know that out there in the dark, behind every dark shadow, they're waiting for us, and we begin to live in dread fear until the police apprehend that person and imprison them and lock them up life without parole. Think of salvation. Forgiveness is, it means that my worst, deadliest enemy is forever removed and gone. Christ's last words assure us that he offers that kind of forgiveness, that kind of love to us, even though he knows we've failed him, sinned against him, resisted him, even mocked him like those thieves did. The question is, do you know that you're forgiven? Do you know that your past is forever gone? Do you know each time you fail God and sin against Christ, even today, he says, I've already forgiven you of that? Because he only died once. That means if he's forgiven one sin, he's already forgiven them all. But if he's not forgiven one, he's not forgiven any. We have to receive complete forgiveness. Do you know there is no sin you could ever commit in the future that could take away your complete forgiveness. Have you experienced Christ's complete forgiveness? Right now, if you don't know that, I want to read something to you. In fact, I had a, a great opportunity this week. I was invited, uh, I, actually it was last Tuesday, I was invited to do a funeral, and when they invited me, I didn't even have a voice, and I said, no. And I got someone else to do it. And then they called and said, we changed the date. Will you do it? And I said, I don't know. I said, I still can't talk. They said, we want you to do it. But I was actually trying not to do it because I never met the person. I didn't even know them. How do you, I've done hundreds of funerals, but how do you talk about someone you've never met? So finally, last Sunday, I sat with the daughter. And I said, tell me about your mom. And I'd already heard that, that mom did not have a clear-cut testimony of salvation. Well, that makes it worse. How do you do a funeral for someone you don't know that you don't even know if they're going to heaven? So I sat out after the first service, and then I heard something. The daughter said, you know, mom, her last five years was in the nursing home, and mom loved it. When those people would come, and they would come to each person in the nursing home with their Bibles and their tracts, their gospel presentations, and they would look at each one of them and say, can I share this with you? Can I share the gospel of Jesus Christ? And this daughter said, Mom would always love to hear them share the gospel and would say, yes, I want that. I want that track." And she'd take it and hold on to it and keep it right with her even though she was totally out of it otherwise. And so, last Tuesday, as I did that funeral for this woman I'd never met, but when I found out, as she lived her last days, that she would take those gospel tracts and she would hold them as dear to her, I decided that I'd just read a track at the funeral. And I think I shocked them all. Because I shared with them the last thing their beloved friend, relative, co-worker had heard from God. And this is what it says. 
It's God's love to all the world that sent Jesus. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And it's God's grace that's displayed by Jesus. Because the scripture says, when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And God commends his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. For all have sinned. And we all fall short of the glory of God. It's God's righteousness that crucified Jesus because God's word says, God made Christ to be sin for us, Jesus who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through Christ. And finally, this little tract said, it's God's mercy that offers us heaven. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Remember? That's why Jesus came and died. That's what the angel told the women, those five plus women. That's what Jesus showed up and told the disciples. He says, I died so you can go and preach repentance for the remission of sin. And as Peter said, it's God's mercy that offers us heaven. That's why Jesus came and died to offer to each of us today. And if we want Jesus, what's amazing is, even though we don't see him today or any day physically, he's still standing like he did in the Gospels. And he still has his arms out as he did on the cross saying, forgive them. He still has his arms st extended to us like he did in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 when he says, come to me all you who are feeling the weight of your sins and you're burdened with them. If you know you're a sinner, come to me. I can give you permanent, eternal rest. Jesus is still here. Jesus offers salvation to anyone who will hear him and is called to salvation. Well, what happens to anyone like this thief who hears and believes and responds to Christ's offer? Well, well, look at verse 39. You're in chapter 23. Look at verse 39. Because I want you to listen to what Jesus promised a guilty thief. Now, if there's ever someone that was guilty, I mean, this guy was, he was nailed down. Clearly, they had the right guy. He was a bad guy. He was a sinner. He was on death row. He was close to expiring. There was no hope for him to join anything, have anybody do anything to him, for him to go through any sacraments. He just was there, dying. And look what Jesus says to him in verse 39. These are Christ's words from the cross to that repentant thief who cried out for mercy. What we'll see is Jesus promised him eternal life on the spot. You know, I like the gospel presentations Christ makes. They don't get all cluttered up with traditions and mixed up by people. You're not sure what they're saying. I mean, Jesus, people understood him. Poor people received him gladly. They said, man, we understand you. You know, he spoke often in primarily monosyllabic words, one-syllable words. You look at the Sermon on the Mount, 50-some percent one-syllable words. I mean, you can get those. They're clear. Listen to what he says, verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were, being, who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Verse 40. But the other answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Do you see the repentance? He says, I'm guilty. I'm going to stop mocking him. Earlier, both thieves were mocking. He says, that's wrong. Then he, he acknowledges who Jesus is. And he says, he, this man, has done nothing wrong. He is who they said he was. The holy, harmless, undefiled, guiltless, innocent Lamb of God. Now look what Jesus said to him. He 
says to Jesus in verse 42, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's one of the strangest salvation prayers I've ever heard. But the Lord doesn't have a formula. He wants direct contact. He said, whoever will call out to me, and he doesn't tell us what they say. He says, you can fill it in. If you will call out to me, and this guy said, Here's my call. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Eight words. That brings us to a question. Jesus promised this guy he had reservations in heaven. On the spot. From that one crying out to him. Do you have reservations in heaven? Christ's message to the thief on the cross declares that he has a place in heaven reserved for anyone who cries out in repentant faith to him. You know, if you analyze those eight words, they're a phenomenal, clear assurance of salvation. Look look what Jesus said to him. Today, not after purgatory, not after limbo, not after you have a little soul sleep. Today, you, yes, you, the guilty convict, no doubt very bad, a man near death, today you will be. Not maybe. Hold on, you might make it. If God doesn't waver, no, Jesus said it would happen. And God never changes. What assurance. Today you will be with me. Not soul sleep, but conscious existence. Not purging leftover sins. But today, with Jesus, immediately upon death, entering life with his Savior, today you'll be with me. See, salvation begins something that never ends. See, that, that's why when I talk to people about whether they're saved, they go, well, uh, 30 years ago. I said, well, what about today? It begins something that never ends. It begins a personal knowing and walking and trusting and living and following Jesus. But he said, today, You will be with me in paradise. Yes, heaven, the presence of God forever. No more sin, no sickness, no death, no sorrow, endless conscious bliss. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now that's soul winning. And that's Jesus. And God says, don't forget. Jesus keeps his promises. Jesus told all the way through his ministry, everyone who is weary of their sins, if they would come to him, they would find on the spot eternal rest. And that's what he still offers to everyone today. So remember what Jesus said. I offer forgiveness. I promise everlasting life. The question comes back. You see, God sent the angel to tell the women. Jesus showed up to tell the disciples. Do you remember why I came? I came so you can go and ask people, have you met Jesus? The one who died, have you met Jesus? The one who paid the price for sin, have you met Jesus? Forgiveness and eternal life are both miracles. I've experienced personally. They're the miracles most in this room have also experienced. If you're forgiven, you have reservations in paradise. That's what Jesus offered from the cross. That's what he accomplished when he stepped forth from the tomb. That's what he offers you today. If you don't know you're forgiven, if you don't know you have reservations in heaven, Jesus stands here today offering salvation. The message of Resurrection Sunday is respond to Jesus today while you can. As believers, do you know what the response is? Overwhelming gratitude. Wonder at how much he forgave us. The response he desires from those who are not believers is saying yes, calling out and receiving salvation. Well, to end the service, let's all stand. It's time. It's 1140. And as you stand on this Easter morning on Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to close with something. And and it's the ending from the little track, you know, the one you pass out to people with Alzheimer's in nursing homes and everywhere else, like I read this week at the funeral. But what this track does is, it explains, enlarges what God said. He said, whoever calls me. 
you know, if, you, if someone's trying to sell you something, they give you their business card, usually has contact information. You know, you can email me here, you can phone me, text me, you know, send a letter to this address. How do you address a cry to God for salvation? That's what gospel tracts give us. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a prayer that could express someone here in this room's desire if you want to transfer, like the thief on the cross did, your trust to the one in the middle, to Jesus Christ. If, if that's your heart's desire, and you want Christ alone for your eternal salvation, something like this example of a cry to him can be the link that connects you to God. And if you cry out to him in faith, not following somebody's formula or doing their set of things, but if you call him and ask him to save you, God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, I'll save. Let's bow, and if you want to in your heart, today you can connect with God's salvation. I'll read this prayer. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know there's nothing I can do to save myself. I confess today. I'm completely helpless. I can't forgive my sins. I can't work my way to heaven. So at this moment, I trust you, O oh Christ, you who bore my sin on the cross, you who gave yourself for me. I believe that what you did is all that's ever necessary for me to come forever with you. I thank you O oh, Father, for raising Christ from the dead to promise that you're going to raise me. As best I can, I transfer my trust to Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you promised to receive me. I know I have many sins and failures. Father, I take you at your word. I thank you I can face death now that you are my Savior. Thank you for the assurance that you will walk me through every day and finally, through the deep valley, thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that someone here, maybe they've come to Calvary for years, decades, but they've never personally asked you to save them. I pray they would today. They would call on your name, not trust that somebody else did something and it's enough, but that you did everything and you're the only one and they invite you to save them. And Father, I pray for all of us that know you and love you, that our hearts will be so overwhelmed that you saved us so that we can tell people that remission of sins is possible if they will just repent and trust you alone. And I pray that tonight would be an amazing offering of worship to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before you go, I want to tell you that at the end of the service, there'll be elders, the leaders of this church, and also godly Titus two women here. If you maybe prayed or maybe you didn't or maybe you just want to get started in your walk with Christ or restarted, they'll be here. Also, out at all the exits, there are track racks. If you want one of these, if you, in fact, if you want to read it or give it to someone, they're on the tables right there. They're at the Welcome Center. They're at all the doors. Remember why Jesus died and what we're supposed to do. God bless you this Resurrection Sunday. Have a blessed day in the Lord.